Okay, we're starting now. I'd like to introduce our speaker. So Mr. Reg Clark, who joins us from London near Kew Gardens. It's a congenial 10 o'clock in the morning there. Uh, uh, Reg Clark graduated in modern history from Christ Church, Oxford in 1979. And in 1980, he joined Kobe Steel, where he worked for three years and played rugby for the team. Uh, he has a lifelong interest in the history of sport, and at that time wrote 12 articles for Rugby Magazine of Japan on the history of rugby. After a varied career, including a further decade at Kobe, Kobe Steel in London, he is now a consultant and investor in the small and medium enterprises, or SME, sector. He took over Rhino, a sports brand specializing in rugby in 2006. And I will put the, their website URL in the chat in a minute. In 2016, he received the Foreign Minister's Commendation Award from the Japanese government for services to UK, Japan relations. And in 2017, he was appointed visiting professor in the sports sciences faculty at Nihon University. Uh, today's lecture was first delivered in 2019, two days before the Rugby World Cup final. It focuses on the history of sport and specifically rugby in Japan and what that may tell us about Japanese culture and the commonly accepted account of the origins of rugby as an example of the role of mythology in history. Well, with that, I pass the ball or the kinemuri to our speaker tonight, Mr. Reg Clark. Take it away. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, yeah, as Patricia said, I'm uh, I'm an SOS speaker, so I'm working off this PowerPoint, which was uh, a lecture I delivered at Nihon Daigaku two days before the Rugby World Cup final, just over two years ago. Before I start, I'd just like to. Uh, as I know, I'm going to be sending this recording to some of my friends. I'd just like to uh, take time out to pay tribute to a wonderful gentleman called uh, Hiroshi Hibino, uh, who was the godfather, the modern godfather of rugby at Waseda University and a very good friend of mine who's died within the last 24 hours. So I just mm. would like to pay tribute to him. And for what it's worth, I'll deliver this lecture in his honor. Um, the in order to, this is going to be a slightly mixed up lecture, in order to put this into context, you have to imagine that <coughs> you are, you're in the, um, uh, the hall at Nihon Daigaku and I am facing 100 current students who want to be lectured on, to on the history of sport in general and 100 visitors from overseas to the Rugby World Cup uh, in Japan who are interested in Japan. So actually, what do we learn about from rugby and its history and what do we learn uh, about Japan from the history of rugby in Japan is one of the various themes but the end theme of this is uh, a bit of a bugbear I have about the way the history of sport is often interpreted and written and um, a particular example about history and its mythology. Um, why is that not working? And now it won't scroll forward I don't believe it. Hang on. Oh, thank goodness. Um, very briefly, uh, this is my writer and collaborator, Satoshi Takahana. We delivered the lecture together. Uh, uh, and you'll probably, for those of you who can read Obscure Kanji, that's Sai, otherwise known as Rhino, uh, the T-shirts we were wearing through the Rugby World Cup. Satoshi and I have been writing in recent months and years for Rugby Magazine, a, a monthly article called The Spirit of Rugby. And as you can see down here, uh, he's very much my collaborator. He happened to be in Tokyo, luckily for me at the time, and we delivered this lecture together. I'm going to go so, through some parts of it quite quickly because it's out of context. But this is one of the 12 articles I wrote on the history of rugby for Rugby Magazine originally, which happens to be the world's largest selling rugby magazine, would you believe, in about 81, 82. And what I pointed out, as you can see from the background here, is that in terms of the United Kingdom, uh, most modern sports such as soccer and rugby are, are all descend, descended from medieval folk games. 
So what would happen in an agricultural setting in a village, particularly, or a small town, on a holiday like Shrove Tuesday, the whole village would get together and kick a ball around in a thinly disguised riot and then go to the pub. Um, and it just so happens that the very small village in County Durham where I was born, called Sedgefield, has one of the more famous Shrove Tuesday ball games. I happened to be back visiting from Japan and went and took, took a few photographs and that formed the basis of one of my articles about the history of rugby, but I will come back to that later. So, what does the history of rugby in Japan tell us about rugby and what does it tell us about Japan? Well, I think first of all, um, and that's part two of the lecture. First of all, rugby, those of us who love rugby and are rugby protagonists would say that more than most games, and a little bit like the martial arts, it's actually defined more by its values than it is by its actual rules. So uh, rugby has the potential to be a very violent game, but actually is not a violent game in the, in the, in the normal sense because it has a value system. And uh, one of the themes of this presentation will be that one of the reasons that rugby has become so popular in Japan is that there is a shared value system with a lot of the background to Japanese society, in, including in particular Bushido. So uh, for the, the benefit of my foreign visitors, this was the history of rugby in Japan. Uh, we're into Mike Galbraith territory here, so I have to pay tribute to Mike, who knows more about this than I do. But this is a very famous print that appeared in the L London Illustrated News in the 1870s. I think 1874, I'm not entirely sure. Mike would know. And as you can see, it says a football match at Yokohama, Japan. If you look at the flag, it's got YFC, which is Yokohama Football Club. Obviously, this is very fanciful and stylized as you can't see Mount Fuji from the bluff in Yokohama, but that's a typical sort of device that they would have used at the time. Um, and as I say, this is a much used uh, image. The interesting thing about this is that, um, that there are two versions of the origins of rugby in Japan. One of them is when did people first start playing rugby in Japan, all of them foreigners, mostly uh, sailors and, uh, and soldiers uh, in Yokohama area. And when did the Japanese start playing it? So there's two separate histories. They're both equally valid. Um, but the Japanese rugby union for many decades were a little bit reluctant to embrace the Yokohama story. They not unreasonably thought the history of rugby in Japan was about when rugby play, was played by Japanese nationals. Um, and Mike Galbraith in particular, who shares my passion for the history of sport and recently did it more formally at De Montford University uh, in Leicester in England, spent a lot of time working on the history of rugby in Yokohama. And he proved that the Yokohama Football Club merged seamlessly into the Yokohama Country and Athletic Club and is actually the the longest continuously surviving rugby club in Asia. Uh, and that was finally accepted by the World Rugby Museum as a fact uh, a few years before the Rugby World Cup. And Mike was finally justified in his endeavors. And the memorial that you see there is one that was erected uh, recognizing his work in Yokohama. So strand one of the history of rugby in Japan, it was played here uh, in the 1860s onwards, 65, 66, by the Yokohama Football Club, and that is the oldest rugby club in Asia, uh, which is a, a great story, and it was much enjoyed during the Rugby World Cup. The story of when Japanese started playing uh, belongs to 1899 and Keio University, um, Keio Gijuku, as it was called. And as you can see, the two gentlemen in the middle are regarded as the founding fathers of rugby in Japan in that sense. Chap on the left is called Edward Bramwell Clark, no relation, has an E on his name. The chap on the right is Ginosuke Tanaka. These two were great friends who certainly were at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge in the early 1890s. I think they might have even gone to school together in Cambridge. Uh, Bramwell uh, has a curious background. His father was a baker in Yokohama, not a Chris Baker, but a Baker Baker. Um, and I think he had a Japanese mother. Was, he went, first went to university in the West Indies and then ended up in Cambridge. But uh, he met Tanaka at Cambridge and they ended up in Tokyo together and decided that they'd teach the students of Keio University how to play rugby. I love this photograph. I think it's a fantastic picture. It's very stylized and uh, 
every vic sorry back i go every victorian sports photograph seems to be styled in this way the guys in the middle the elder guys the more experienced ones are wearing a cap uh, but the interesting thing is how the japanese have learned the trick of staring into the distance which is very cool victorian thing some of you could look at the camera but it was far more cool to be looking sideways into the distance but as i was chatting to patricia the other day you want to look at the physique of these guys i think the idea that the japanese were unsuited to rugby because they weren't big enough i mean look at this chap here and this chap i mean these guys are built for rugby um so uh, and as i say imagine that i'm this is for the interest of foreign visitors to japan I'm, I'm delivering this particular lecture at the time now, the reason I put this slide up is apropos the idea that rugby uh, is a game that's based on values. And some of the rugby guys listening in will know that recently in the professional era, about 10 years ago, the game in England had a big crisis because one of the professional teams, the Harlequins, were caught cheating um, in a way that would, in most sports, be regarded as very minor, but it occasioned a huge amount of hand-wringing and angst in rugby. And so much so that the England team produced this slide, which was sent to every rugby club in England. And they said, this, these are the values of the game. Teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, sportsmanship. The game isn't most importantly about winning. It's how you behave. And I think that's a very valuable part of the game. And that my colleagues at Nihon Daigaku, sports science department, who are interested in the history of sport, very much take the view that rugby, one of the reasons that rugby for most of recent Japanese history has been far more popular than soccer, for example, is that rugby chimed more with, uh, with Japanese values. And in particular, you all may know, this is a very famous book that went to several editions and was very widely read in the West, in the US and the UK, Bushido, The Soul of Japan by Nitobo Inazo, which really for the first time opened up to the West um, the samurai Bushido value system. And my Japanese colleagues take the view that one of the reasons rugby is popular is it's, it's very similar to that. Two expressions that many Japanese people use in the context of rugby are noblesse oblige and no side. Um, and they're both slightly curiously used out of context. Noblesse oblige really refers to the ideas of uh, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, the founder of the modern Olympics, who was a regular visitor to the rugby school and uh, met with the teachers there and the staff and discussed the uh, view of sport and in education with, with, uh, in the English public school system. So noblesse oblige is a much used phrase in Japan, but it kind of has this sort of um, vibe of, um, uh, of a value system whereby older people uh, must behave well towards the younger ones. Uh, no side is a curious one because it's very well recognized and known in Japan, but has fallen out of use everywhere else in the world. I remember over 50 years ago when I started playing rugby uh, in the northeast of England, uh, the referee would blow the whistle at the end of the game and say no side. And what that meant, and it, it is a curious expression, it meant the game's over, it doesn't matter who won, uh, it's now time to shake hands and move on and forget the result. But that idea really has stuck in Japan and the no side spirit is what a lot of Japanese people talk about. This slide I put up to demonstrate an interesting fact, which I think chimes with this, which is that um, when Japan hosted the Olympics in 1964, they, as the host nation, were allowed to introduce judo as their nominated sport. And it's been in the Olympics ever since. And the curious thing is that a lot of leading lights in the world of judo at that time were vehemently opposed to this because they said, well, judo, the gentle way, as we know, uh, it means, I believe, um, is not about winning. It's not about gold medals and silver medals. It's actually about self-discipline, the practice of this physical exercise, respect for the opponent. Winning and losing is not part of it. And actually, if you look at what happened to the history of rugby, whereas soccer went professional in the late 19th century rugby as we'll see later deliberately didn't and actually really didn't promote the idea of organized competitions rather than friendly matches probably for the next hundred years so i think i think there is something in the idea that there's a shared value system here so 
rugby started really with Bramwell, Clark and Ginoske Tanaka uh, in 1899 in Keio. Didn't really take off until the 1920s. And the godfather of Japanese rugby in many senses is this gentleman, Shigeru Kayama, uh, was a Todai graduate, very connected to the upper echelons uh, of Japanese society, went on a tour of Europe uh, and indeed the world with the then crown prince and later emperor in the early 20s. And at, during that time, he stopped off in London to train and play rugby with both Richmond and Harlequins rugby clubs. He went back to Japan and um, founded essentially, the, uh, was the leading light behind the foundation of the Japan Rugby Union in 1926 and wrote a definitive book uh, about rugby. Um, Incidentally, Mike and Ian, I've never seen a copy of this, and I'd be very interested to know if either of you are aware of anyone uh, in possession of the particular book, but it definitely existed, and it, it was probably called Rugby, uh, and it was the first ever Japanese language introduction to the wider public uh, about the game. The interesting, and this was a fact that was designed to interest and charm foreign visitors for the Rugby World Cup, this shirt was on display in the World Rugby Museum's uh, mini museum in central Tokyo. And it's the oldest surviving Japanese rugby jersey from the 1930s, post Kayama. And this was a, a wonderfully romantic idea by Kayama. I'm sure Mike knows all about this, but the, the three cherry blossoms, as it still is today, two of them were open and one of them wasn't. And Kayama's idea was that uh, only when Japan was able to play on an equal basis with the other leading rugby nations of the world would they allow the third flower to open, which is a, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, and you can see the modern shirt uh, open. And it, happens to, it happened that in 1952, in a very well-remembered historic tour, Oxford University toured Japan, and it was decided that that marked the point at which they were on an equal footing with the rest of the world. So the the third flower on the cherry blossom was opened then. Another wonderful romantic story for me is the fact that at the, at the time that Kayama went back to Japan, founded the Japan Rugby Union, uh, he befriended a, a famous English war poet called Edmund Blunden, who was at that time professor of English at Tokyo University. And the book is referred to in this poem written by Blunden which is now actually the rugby club song for to Tokyo University. I I'll read it to you. Uh, I hear from winters long ago, resounding to the frosty sky, the shouts of feet, feet, feet go low, the splendid roar that hailed the try. I hear from winters yet to come, those old glad cries from new throats hurled and feel when you and I are dumb, still rugby will refresh the world. This is a wonderfully uh, romantic phrase and remember this guy was fighting in the trenches on the western front just a few years before this friend may this book of you of yours advance so he's referring to the book that Kayama wrote this noble sport in old Japan till your disciples take on France England New Zealand when they can may we be there to swell the cheers that loud and brilliant will proclaim Japan's first try in after years could your heart wish a happier fame? So that was written by Edmund Blunden for his friend Kayama, the leading light in the foundation of the Japan Rugby Union. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating about sport and the cultural uh, traffic both ways is the way that um, the rituals of the game are taken up as well as the, as the game itself. So uh, if you see uh, uh, in the UK or elsewhere, Martial arts are practiced. A lot of the ritual, ritualization in terms of bowing and politeness are uh, observed. And equally in Japan, I can just imagine uh, people like Kayama and Edward Bramwell Clark telling the Japanese that it's very, very important that you get together after the game, have a beer and sing a few songs. And I remember from my days at Kobe Steel, this would be absolutely ritualized. If we played Toyota, we would gather in a room like this sing the Kobe Steel song, which I still remember vividly. And I still sing it with my old colleagues when we get together. Um, and uh, this is a perfect example of this. And there's a particular reason to play it because 
you'll see that the Tokyo University Rugby Club team are actually singing Edmund Blunden's words, which is their company, which is their rugby song. But they're playing against the National Defence Academy. It's a bit of a shaky video, so bear with me. And notice the use of English in this. And now we have the Todai team. Now, I'm sure um, Mike and Chris and others who uh, played rugby in Japan will have seen a lot of that stuff. And um, I think it's an interesting thought that in, when uh, domestic politics in Japan went in a certain direction in the 1930s and foreign words were discouraged, um, it was decided that rugby as a foreign terminology wouldn't be used and the game was known as Tokyo, fighting ball. Um, but curiously, all through that period, Tokyo University was still singing their English song written by Edmund Blunden, which I think is quite sort of curious and wonderful historical fact. Now, um, so what does the history of rugby in Japan tell us about rugby and about Japan? Well, rugby is a game with values and it's flourished in Japan largely because those values to a remarkable degree resonated with the Japanese public in a way that I would say, for example, soccer didn't. Um, so that was part one of my uh, lecture, uh, which was really designed to uh, give something for foreign visitors to think about as they were in town for the Rugby World Cup. The second part, what does the history of rugby tell us about history? Um, well, I think it, what it tells us is that um, history is full of mythology. Uh, and uh, in particular, I have a bee in my bonnet about the very fact that rugby is called rugby uh, and on uh, all of the uh, the origin myths that surround the, the history, the, the story of the history of the game. But anyway, this may or may not be of interest to you, but let's give it a go. So an interesting thing about uh, the British Imperial Project was our determination to tell the world that we invented every single sport that, that ever happened. Uh, we might possibly have let, let baseball go, but we would probably say that was that started off with rounders. But uh, and a few examples of this would be, the, and the dominance of the public schools is very important here. So you may or may not have know of a game called fives. It's like uh, squash, but played with a glove and a ball. And even now to this day, there are at least four or five different types of fives, Eton fives, rugby fives, charterhouse fives. So 
the English public schools in the 19th century are very determined to have their own versions of every game. And they're absolutely determined in many cases that it should be the dominant one. Um, another example of uh, the Victorians naming sports was uh, badminton. Um, it's been played for years in various parts of the world in the UK, uh, called uh, Battledore in some places and Shuttlecock in others. But actually, the, uh, the Duke of Beaufort's estate, Badminton House, decided that they would call the, call, the na call the game after themselves. So Badminton became Badminton because of that. Now, I think the most amusing example of this is the uh, dispute as to who invented table tennis, ping pong, or what you might call whiff-waff. And if you'd like an example of uh, the mentality behind the determination of the British to claim they invented every sport, I give you this speech made by Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London at the British Embassy at the closing ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. This is magnificent. I draw your attention, in fact, Paul Newton to Lord Colin Moynihan, who was a fellow boxer of yours at Oxford University, the chairman of the British Olympic Association at the back, and the very famous Lord Sebastian Coe, who don't know whether to hide or to cry laughing at this. Every single one, virtually every single one of our international sports were either invented or codified by the British. Uh, I say this respectfully to our Chinese hosts who have excelled so magnificently at ping pong. Ping pong was invented on the dining table of England. It was and it was called Wiswap. We can have the essential difference between us and the rest of the world. Other nations, the French, looked at the dining table and saw an opportunity to have dinner. We looked at the dining table and saw an opportunity to play Wiswap. That's why London is the sporting capital of the world. And I say to the Chinese, and I say to the world, ping pong is coming home. Now, uh, I think that's fantastically funny. Um, and I did enjoy Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London. I'm not enjoying him as much as prime minister, but we won't go on to that. So all of these sports, fives, uh, badminton, ping pong, whiff waff, who invented them, who claims the credit? Now, I would say that a simple act like kicking a ball around is the sort of thing that has been done by every society that has leisure time. If you've got leisure time, you do stuff like you invent chess, you, 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 you find a way of kicking a ball in a competitive way and you make up games. So here we go back to my original article for Rugby Magazine in the early eighties. Uh, all of these agricultural labors get a day off. What do they do? They kick a ball around, they smash up the village and they go to the pub. That's what people do when they get leisure time. And the idea of who invented football is a curious one because it's ended up uh, naturally occurring all over the world. So there is an example of a game called La Soule in uh, Lower Normandy uh, in France, exactly the same scene as in my village of Sedgefield in County Durham. Still played even to this day, every show's Tuesday. This idea of a, uh, uh, of a near, near riot, uh, just as an excuse for a bit of letting off steam. And even in uh, both in Japan and China, uh, I, uh, you have a similar history. Uh, I was in China visiting a sports goods company in near Nanjing several years ago. And they, at that time, China was bidding to, to host the Soccer World Cup. And they played a video, uh, the thrust of which uh, football was invented in China. And it was a game called Kamari. Now, uh, exactly the same name, Kamari, is used for games that were uh, essentially a game of what we would now call keepy uppy, played uh, at various uh, locations in the Heian era. And in this particular one, this is the Shimo Damo Shrine in Kyoto. On January the 4th, every year, they have a reenactment of what is called Kamari, both in Japan and China. So. You know, it's quite obvious that the sort of idea of the invention of football is, is, uh, is an odd one because there are various kinds of it have existed all over the world. But 
the Victorian British, as per Boris Johnson's speech, were very good at codifying these games and claiming ownership. And in one sense, in rugby, it all starts off with his very famous book, Tom Brown's School Days, um, one of the best-selling books of the Victorian era, uh, which uh, popularised the myth of Thomas Arnold, the, very, the pioneering rugby school headmaster, and his views on education and the importance of sport in education, which was quite new at that time. Uh, and it, the, the, the book features extensive descriptions of, of rugby, of football, as played uh, at that time. Now, uh, this is the bit where I'm lecturing the students at Nihon Daigaku, who know, in my opinion, very little about the history of sport. You may not be interested in this. It's not got much to do with Japan, but here goes. I'll try and finish the lecture. Um, so sp sport, sport is either played as a riot uh, in villages uh, on, on high days and feast days in the UK, or it's codified by the, the public schools and Eton are playing their game, Charterhouse are playing their game, rugby are playing their game. Uh, and gradually two forms of the, of, of the sport develop. The, the one where you're allowed to run with the ball, championed by rugby school, or the one where you're not, mostly championed by Eton and Charterhouse. But association football or soccer is not called Eton football, it's called association football soccer. Uh, whereas curiously, the handling form of the game is called uh, rugby. Now that's fine, rugby school, uh, and I know Mike's son went there, codified the game, and were very early on, very, very quick to establish their ownership of this sport. Um, but what then happened both in soccer and rugby uh, in particularly the 1856 Factory Act instituted a half day holiday on Saturdays in the United Kingdom for the first time. So this is actually the 1833 Factory Act shown here. But what it meant was that ordinary people actually, they weren't allowed to do anything on Sunday and they actually had Saturday afternoons free and they started playing sport in great numbers. And you have a, what you have is a, is, uh, a, a classic cultural clash uh, which, you know, you could say this is the Marxist view of history, but all of a sudden you have all of these factory workers in the Midlands and the north of England in particular playing regularly. And in the case of people like miners, they're quite strong people. They're quite good at rugby. And you have this situation where the, the people who believe they own football, rugby, soccer, all of them from public schools, go to London, they're solicitors, they're working for the Bank of England, whatever, they kind of feel an ownership of this game and they actually are very shocked to find that they are being beaten by a load of factory workers. So if you're interested in this particular part of history in terms of soccer, um, Julian Fellows, who wrote, uh, amongst other things, Downton Abbey, recently wrote a series of, uh, for Netflix called The English Game. Uh, it came out in 2020. And if you haven't seen it and you're interested in this and you want to hear all about the old Etonians and Blackburn Rovers and Blackburn Olympic, um, that's well worth seeing, the English game. So what you have here is 1872, the FA Cup winners, all the way through to 82, all of these people are largely London-based uh, public school boys uh, who are in the army at Oxford University. They get together, they form a team called the Wanderers. And all of a sudden in 1882, Blackburn Rovers, a team of factory workers, are beaten by the Old Etonians, and next year, Blackburn turn it around. But from that point on, 1883 onwards, all of these teams are possibly semi-professional factory workers from the Midlands and the north of England. So at that point, the game's up for the public school boys. The game isn't called Eton football, and they're never going to win the FA Cup ever again. So what happens in rugby? Something slightly different happens in rugby. Something very different happens in rugby. The county championship is formed in 1899 and it's won continuously by Yorkshire and Lancashire until the famous date of 1895 when there was an argument about whether the players, the factory workers should be paid uh, uh, broken time payments in lieu of missing work to, to travel to play. Uh, and whereas in soccer, it was decided it was perfectly okay to pay these people, Rugby were adamant, the people running rugby were absolutely adamant that it wouldn't happen. And in 1895, rugby split into two parts, rugby league, professional in the north of England and then Australia, 
mostly, uh, and rugby union in the rest of the country. And essentially that was a way of uh, rugby school itself and all of the people from that kind of background maintaining their ownership of the game of rugby as they played it. And the curious thing is that the, the origin myth of the game of rugby union, which is that William Webb Ellis in 1823 interrupted a game of proto soccer, picked the ball up and ran with it, thus forming, the, uh, or thus defining the origins of the game, was actually invented in the 1890s by old boys of rugby school who felt very challenged by all of this thing. They didn't like losing to teams of minors from Yorkshire. That wasn't, that wasn't what it was supposed to happen. So they not only were very hard line about broken time payments, thus triggering the split between the sport, but they actually said, and by the way, you do know why this is called rugby, don't you? Because William Webb Ellis did what he did. Now, if you can read that page very quickly, uh, in the very early stages of rugby, the, the people in Scotland were basically not buying into the idea that they were playing rugby. They called it the great parent code. And they, uh, uh, people in the North England and Scotland were really not very keen that the game was going to be called rugby. And the, the old boys of rugby school were very keen that it should. So they invented the William, William Webb Ellis story, which is, as I say, an example of an individual origin myth. Now, this isn't the most important historical thing in the world who invented rugby, but I think it's a perfect example of, of the way history works. The facts are irrelevant. It's the person who tells the best story and tells it most convincingly. And it's the person who wins that matters, not the facts. So there's a statue of William Webb Ellis. He, um, he was a real person. He went to rugby school, he went to Oxford. He played in the first ever Oxford against Cambridge cricket match. He became a, a vicar. And he uh, died and is buried at Monton on the French Riviera. And he died completely oblivious to the fact that his name was going to be hijacked for the purposes of this myth. He had no idea that he was going to be credited with the foundation of the game of rugby. But nevertheless, there's his grave on the French Riviera, the first rugby player. And there's the famous plaque, first took the ball in his arms and ran with it, thus originating the distinctive feature of the rugby game in AD 1823. And uh, Mike, I know you. I know you may not like this because your son went to rugby school, but you know it's true. So this is an article I wrote again in the early '80s, exposing that fact and trying to teach Japanese people that the William Webb Ellis story is really an utter load of rubbish, uh, and it needs to be seen in that light. However, it had huge buy-in for years. Um, that's the. I won't bother reading it, but the <laughs> the opening introduction to the. England rugby centenary history was just it's just an embarrassment in terms of historical terms and you'd have a centenary game played at rugby school between these sides and I my finishing point uh, for my audience at the two days before the Rugby World Cup was astonishingly when the Rugby World Cup was finally instituted in so imagine rugby unions existed for over 100 years and they haven't got a, a World Cup yet. But they first had it in 1987. And in my opinion, astonishingly, the International Rugby Football Board decided to call the trophy the Webb Ellis Cup, which I think is unbelievable, given the, pl the plain facts of the situation. So people are much happier with this fairy tale. Well, fair enough. Th does it really matter? No. But I think it tells you something about history. This was my final slide. Um, I was very honoured that a very good friend of mine, David Kirk, the first ever winner of the Rugby World Cup in 1987, was in the audience. And my final slide was to the effect that I was going to start a campaign to have the William Webb Ellis Trophy renamed after my home village. And that henceforth, it should be known as the Sedgefield Trophy. I haven't made a lot of progress with that so far, I must say. So there you are. Uh, that was my lecture. And... Uh, very diverse and a bit unfocused, but I hope uh, as an SOS filler, some of you found it reasonably interesting. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, my goodness. Um, there's about 45 minutes officially, I suppose we can. There's a few questions, but just a few here in the chat. Uh, let's see here. Um, 
the name of, okay. Maybe my, com maybe my question is the only question in here. There's a lot of interesting commentary. Uh, I, I wanted to know what is a parent code? You said the Scottish wanted to call rugby a parent code, but that doesn't make well, any they, sense. Uh, I think they may have, there was an argument, the first ever uh, in 1870, 1871, England played soccer, both uh, England played Scotland for the first time at soccer and rugby. And in both cases, the, the game was preceded by an argument as to what the rules were. And the English said, uh, well, we'll tell you what the, game, the rules of rugby are um, because we invented <coughs> rugby. Uh, and the Scots said, we've been playing this game for centuries. You know, this is the great parent code. You know, and we'll, we'll decide between us what the rules are. So there was this element of arguing about the rules and the ownership. And as Mike knows, a lot of the early arguments were about a thing called hacking, whether you were allowed to kick each other in the shins for no reason, which uh, <laughs> the old Rugbeans were very keen on, actually, but they eventually got rid of it. So, um, yeah, I think people in Scotland and the north of England are resistant to the idea that the game was invented by someone else, actually, when they feel as if they've been playing forms of it for centuries, is my point. And I'm a chippy guy from the north of England, which is the whole point behind my obsession. So the parent code was basically no ki no kicking in the people in the shins. No, no, no it's not. It's more common. The, the parent code was the bit where we run around with the ball in our hands um, and not just kicking it. Soccer, soccer is a refine. The great parent code is is 400 blokes in a village running around just causing mayhem. There's no rules that you then get refinements of the game. And soccer is the ultimate refinement. It's quite obvious that soccer is a refinement of an earlier form of the game where you handle a ball. And the Webb Ellis myth is nonsense at various levels. And one of them is that these guys were playing a, far, a form of proto soccer and Webb Ellis picked the ball up and then for invented rugby. It's completely the wrong way around in terms of the development of sport, as well as being just a made up story. So, parent, so parent is sort of like the original, not not your mother and father kind of parent. Yeah, the medieval, me, yes, okay. medieval folk games. <laughs> medieval <laughs> folk games, I would call them. All right. Yeah. As, as, as uh, in the example of the French example, you saw. Oh, um, yes, please, uh, Reg, could you stop the stop the screen share now? Okay. My apologies. Yes, good point. Thank you. Okay, now oh, we can yeah. see everybody. That's great. Uh, all right, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, that was it, I think. Okay, well, there's a few more questions that have come in. Uh, let's see here, uh, Giulio Antonio Bertelli, friend of the show, says, thanks for the int very interesting talk. In ancient Rome, there was a ball game called Harpastum. It was some kind of handball inherited from the Greeks, which is said to be the ancestor of the Calico Fiorentino, Florentine's football or historical soccer, and which is for some aspects similar to rugby, definitely more violent. I wonder how this influenced the birth of rugby and soccer as we know them today. Well, I mean, I've heard of Harpastum, and I think, you know, um, you can go back to the, the Greeks for the Olympics. It's very, it's not so easy to actually trace origins of football type games back to the Greeks and Romans. I've heard of Harpastum. Um, what was was um, Florentine soccer developed from Harpastum? Probably. Does Italy also and Greece have also claims on uh, having played ball games just as the Japanese and Chinese played Kamari? Definitely. No doubt about it. I just think these are all examples of my earlier point that you can't claim that anyone invented football. It's such a natural, it's an, you know, kicking something around when you in your spare time is a very natural human proclivity. Um, but isn't, isn't, isn't the great thing that, um, you know, somehow from all around the world, we, we, we've bought into some common values? Absolutely. That, that's, the, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I, I maybe didn't emphasize that enough. People don't come together in a codified form of sport because they buy into the values. 
certainly the case. I mean, I would say there's no doubt rugby, along with perhaps the martial arts, is more than most sports, is a value-based sport rather than its rules. Because actually, in its raw form, it has the potential to be very dangerous. And only an agreed value system can prevent that level of danger. But some people would say, as Mike said earlier, that the professional game is, is slightly losing sight of that. Um, I just want to pick up on the point about um, rugby being more popular than soccer in Japan. Um, I'm not so sure. I would say until the advent of the J-League, which has surpassed uh, rugby in recent years in terms of spectator popularity, I, I really don't think soccer was a more popular sport in Japan from... 100 years up to the beginning, up to the formation of the J-League. But then you'd have to define numbers of participants, spectators, what, you know, what makes a sport popular. Uh, I, don't, I was just unaware, up to the advent of the J-League, of, of any profile for soccer. Uh, well done, Ohigashi-san. The, the, <laughs> uh, the point is, though, that the Japanese play soccer in, in, a, in a way similar to the, the, to the English, which is... Um, um, it, with respect for the for the fundamentals of the game, for 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 the 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 code of sport. Yeah. Well, I think generally globally, I don't think anyone would argue that rugby players, rugby people, aren't being too self righteous by saying that in general, rugby fans in particular and players behave better than soccer. Certainly, the fans. Um, <laughs> And I just think, I think rugby can claim to be guided by, by values. Now, the Japanese are very polite people. They would play any sport with respect for the rules. But in terms of globally, I, I think the point stands. Um, and I don't, I, don't really, I don't think, I mean, I, all the time I've lived and been traveling to Japan until the advent of the J League, in terms of universities and high schools, I was unaware that that soccer had a well, had any kind of profile really. But in Japan plays at a very high level, and and, and um, you know both both their players and their fans. I mean, you think about um, the uh, the World Cup where they they cleared up the stadiums. Um, you know, um, they they they're kind of leading the way in in creating Can I also a new, just... new ethos in football. Jump in yeah, I, I, I completely agree, but that you must admit that's a very recent phenomenon. The J League is very can I, can I jump in there about that? Because it's not recent. I mean, the Japan had the Japan Soccer League in 1965. Uh, that was a national league. It they had it added at second division in the 70s. Uh, they were semi-professional in the 80s. They were already having top Brazilian managers and players coming over. They were getting decent crowds, not high, but the average. JSL crowd in the 80s was for the top division was about 3,000, which was mm -hmm. pretty decent. So I think with the playing population, um, I haven't got the figures to hand, but the playing population for soccer association, football soccer, was mm. second only to baseball and close to baseball already in the 80s. And every school mm. had a, now every senior high school had a, a soccer team. They didn't all have rugby teams in the 80s, definitely not. Uh, you may well be right on that. I mean, I'm not. I, I'm not going to mm. die in the ditch on this because I don't know enough about soccer too. I'm yeah. just giving my impression. I mean, I, you may be right in terms of participation numbers. Um, yeah, but also, it's the Empress Cup. You know, the the Empress Cup level is... rugby was... so an interesting <laughs> factor, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, regarding high school uh, tournaments, uh, rugby and soccer started the same time. Mm. Same year, financed by uh, Osaka Mainichi Shimbun. Cool, but uh, I, you know, my personal opinion is that somehow university soccer didn't. didn't I think that's true. I think that's true. Soccer. The rugby went with universities. Um, the university rugby competition, the six universities, that became hugely popular in Japan with television. Yes, um, was I'm not sure about whether it was as big as the university, anything in particular, the rugby, the baseball was huge in the 30s, of course, 20s and 30s. I don't know how big rugby and football university competitions were then. I, I just well, don't know. But Wasser, yeah. Wasser, they would play Teo in front of um, a full Olympic stadium. So, I mean, hmm. you, you've got a, so a soccer they... league match with average crowds of 3,000 and you've got 
40,000 people watching Ross of the KO. Um, um, yeah, but, yeah, but I'm talking about a, a year-long league as against a sort of special event. And so the Emperor's Cup finals were not getting 3,000 people. They were... Uh, they weren't actually filling the stadium either. It was 60,000 capacity then, the National Stadium. But they were getting 30,000, 40,000 for the Empress Cup finals. Of course, you could, the that. So, so, so you could interpret that as simply as the carryover of the elitist um, uh, nature of rugby um, to Japan and, and the, um, the non-elitist nature of, of soccer. Um, in, in as much as you know, lots of very rich people uh, sending their kids to university and, and going to watch them at the stadiums, whereas you know, soccer was um, it, it's not a university game.